Welcome to So You Want to Be an Ally. We share our stories and our insights on non-Black allyship to Black women. My name is Darlene. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I help parents advocate for their Black and Brown kids' emotional and racial identity development needs. And that's because our kids deserve the opportunity to grow, learn, strive, and thrive. My name is Olani Ke. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And my life experience led me to becoming an advocate for equity in the workplace, which led me to starting a consulting business where I help workplaces who want to do better. Want to be an ally? Gather around and listen up. We are back with another episode in our Tools for Allyship, our Parenting Edition segment. And today we're going to continue sharing our experiences of parenting while Black. So yes. let's jump into today's question of the day. Do Black mothers have the talk? So we're bringing up the talk because it's received a great deal of attention over the past few years with Americans and now the world making note of police brutality against Black Americans. If you're not familiar with or have never heard about the talk, here is a quick overview. The talk is a shitty rite of passage that is unique <laughs> to Black parenting in America. Yes, Lord. I know that's not a you know official definition, but I, I just I just had to shitty. get that out there first. That's just I support it just, you. It just is. We're gonna hold um, that space for you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but it, to put it really succinctly, it is us sharing rules of behavior for kids, for our kids to have around law enforcement to make sure that they leave that interaction alive. And why do we even have the talk? Why does it even exist? So from my standpoint, I think about, as we've talked about in, a, in the first segment, the first couple segments of this parenting edition, it's like we do a lot as Black parents around preparation. If, if my kid's going to be alive, if my kid's going to navigate the space safely, sometimes, you know, it doesn't always end up being just the extreme of life or death, even though we think about that a lot. But again, think about what we talked about last, the last of episodes. It's like emotional safety, emotional security, mm -hmm. right? So I'm always trying to prepare and expose them and give them exposure to topics, content, ideas. Um, so that they can feel like they understand. So for me, that's the why. And and ultimately, mm. to be honest, it really boils down to our own peace of mind from yeah. my perspective, because sometimes we don't have control over this, right? Think about yeah. all the moms who've lost their loved ones, all the moms who've had to pick their kids up at juvenile because of some experience, right? We're hoping, we're hoping <laughs> that this will be enough. It's somewhere between like an act of faith and desperation mm. because you can do, you can follow the rules of behavior to a T and still end up shot. So that's, that's why it's shitty. Yep. And we start to think about having this talk with our kids. I think it's not necessarily an age, but it's more, more about when we feel like they've gotten to the point where they're not under our control. They're not within our span of control, our watchful eye. Yeah. They're not with other people that we know or, <laughs> or yep. kind of have them um, under their watchful eye in the, in the way that we would. So typically yep. that's like when they're by middle school, because then they're in sports and they're yep. with coaches. And, yep. you, know, you know, I would say for most kids, <laughs> probably by middle school, they've had some mm -hmm. version of the talk, if not the yep. whole thing. It can be very early. Yep. It can be 10, it can be seven or eight. I mean, some kids are out here really navigating the world at yeah. an earlier age than others. And yep. therefore their parents have to prepare them. So it's more about, hmm, you're gonna be out of my you know, care yep. and you may come across a situation where you have to talk to even a security guard, a yep. police officer, like anyone of that anyone, nature. Anyone, right? And that's what I was thinking too, as yeah. you were talking, like it really does depend on the community and a neighborhood and yes. what your family dynamics is. Because if you're in a certain neighborhood, the cops could be posted up at the corner and you might right. come in contact with the cop at seven. Depends on the neighborhood, depends on yeah. the presence of police officers in your like immediate vicinity. It depends on, you know, what the family makeup is. Maybe the child's more independent. Maybe the parent has to allow them out of their watchful eye just a lot sooner, just because that's what we got to do sometimes, you know? So, and even along the lines of what you were saying about there being no clear when, I don't think there's a clear where either. 
I think we pick up the conversation whenever, Where whenever and wherever. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, <laughs> and I'm laughing right now because Chris will tell you, I will go into my lectures, honey. Like <laughs> we will become so serious. I'm going in a lecture when I'm, he's sitting down there and I'm twisting his hair. I'm going to lecture when we're driving in the car, I'm probably dropping him off at an activity. I'm, or I'm taking him to McDonald's and all he asked for was some fries. And he, he get like, this Mom, whole lecture. <laughs> all I asked for was some fries, huh? <laughs> Mama, really? Right now? And at this point, it's never words. It's always a look, right? Because he's not hes not the verbal kid, but he'll just be looking like. And then after I'm done, I'll see his face and I'm like, oh yeah, I probably, you probably wouldn't expect me. He was like, my mom used to it. So. <laughs> So, you know, that that's kind of when we have the talk with our kids. It's like, there's no when and there's no where that's specific. It's wherever it comes up, whenever something triggers us. The media yeah. can prompt us, a situation yeah. has come up. It literally is an intrusive thought on the parents' perspective. And that's, when, that's really where not. I have it. Or yeah. I could be planning a trip or I know that there's going to be some exposure to the police or some authority figure, right? Because sometimes it's not always just the police. Sometimes yeah. it's an authority figure that could then result in bringing the police into the Absolutely. equation. So then, you know, it could be, where is it? Right outside before I let you go into this basketball game that you're about to play. All right. When you mm. leave out, you know, when you leave out yeah. here, you know, this is what's expected. So yep. make sure you take these steps. You know, it's really interesting because we also wanted to talk about the how. And you just alluded to something. What is inside the talk? Mm. How do we communicate these rules of behavior? How is it structured? Yeah. What you said made me think about like part of the talk is also like giving them the rules of, I don't know, of, of being to avoid an interaction with law enforcement so that they don't even have to engage in the rules that we give them for getting through that interaction alive. So there is a whole, there's a piece of the talk that is, all, first of all, it's ongoing, mm -hmm. um, but there's a piece of the talk that is, how do you avoid this interaction in the first place? And that, that part feels like we are playing a part in the oppression. Like mm. it's really hard because it, it makes me feel like, like when I have to tell my daughter, you can't do certain things mm. that I know that as a child, she should be able to do that mm. and not be worried about, oh, this could mean that an adult, an authority figure yep. or, or like law, a cop sees me this way and that could escalate in all these ways. She should yep. just be able to play and live. So there's that part of the talk. And then there's the, okay, you find yourself in an unavoidable situation and it's happening. Here are the things to, to know and to, to do in those, in those moments. Sometimes it is we're able to have the talk before an incident ever happens, but a lot of time it's because of an incident. And the incident, I think, like you said, could be media prompted, but it could also be that they've seen something in their family. Mm -hmm something happened in their presence or something happened to their family member that's getting discussed, or it could be something that has happened directly to them that they're trying to make sense of. And it's not always, you know, an extreme situation, even though it could be, it could be something that's less extreme, like, oh, you know, two kids got into trouble for something at school, right. but the black kid got right. suspended while the other kid, you know, gets a slap on the wrist. They get detention. Well, hmm, that's interesting. What's going on there? So sometimes it's little things like that, that sort of starts to, they start to notice like there's something unfair about this. And then we end up in a conversation about the shitty rite of passage. The shitty rite of passage. So to answer the question. Yes. Do black mothers have the talk? Do we? We definitely do, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't think I've had the police like driving talk. Cause that's always what I think about when yeah. I think about the most recent like attention that's been given to the talk, like, hey, this is how you drive. I do know that when he starts to drive, I'll definitely have that specific yeah. talk. But yeah. have I had the talk about how to interact around authority figures and yeah. uh, the police? I yeah. have. Now, I think it's a very interesting intersection for me, given that I raised my child to be very vocal. I definitely think Black mothers have the talk for sure, um, mostly because we are the protectors. And we always, to the point that you made about that hope, like the intersection of like hope, yeah. right? It's like, I got to protect you. And in order to protect you, knowledge is power. And so let's sit down and talk about this plan. Yeah. What about you? Like a lot of the ongoing conversations that I have with her, it has built over time. Okay. So it, it does start out with a with 
conversations about authority figures. And that's interesting that you brought up the driving thing because since we're not there yet, we have not had the, this is what you do, mm-hmm. you pulled over mm-hmm. in a car because that's not relevant. But we've had talks about authority mm-hmm. figures in, in, in school settings and sports settings, like yep. in, in the settings where, where she finds herself. And I think it's, it's interesting to think about Black mothers having the talk because, you know, I don't know if this is true or not because I, I don't think about it in this way, but I would assume, I would, I I wonder if people assume that this is a conversation from like black adult men to black boys. Mm, Yeah. What I mean? Like, I'm like, huh, I wonder if this is the assumption that's out there. (laughs) That that's because you're thinking when you see a lot of the news stories that makes the TV is men or black, black men or black boys. Yep. We don't see the incidents with black women, even though they are plentiful. Those don't make uh, new, let's not get into the whole conversation about, you know, the invisibility of black women and all of that. That's a whole nother show. But yes, black mothers are having this conversation constantly. I think part of it is is that, you know, we're also, there's an intuitiveness that we feel when we're like, it's time for you to know this. Yes. If it's not, you know, if if it's not like an incident is, is prompting it. When we, because we are constantly, I think, doing the calculation of what do you need to know yep. in order to stay safe in the world, <laughs> yep. and so it's just a part of the way we live and breathe and raise them. And so yep. sooner or later, we're gonna get to that point. We don't even have to like consciously decide. But it's like, hmm, nope. it's time. You need to know this. Yep. And that's what I like. What you just said about the calculation of safety. Yeah. That's that's essentially what it is, right? We're that's calculating that. our moves to this context of parenting while black. This is why it's extra. Yeah. (laughs) Because I have an additional, yeah, I have an additional additional calculation about safety. Not just regular schooling, not just the pedophiles, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Not just the the um the folks who will, you know, abduct you or anything like that. Not health concerns, not just Mm You know, not just the things, right. Not, right. right? not middle school, you know, yep. hormones and drama and all like, Dating like and all of that is there. Plus conf- self-confidence. It's on top of the calculations of safety. Right. And right. for that reason, I think it's that thing that you just turned that really opens us to this dialogue around the other talks that moms have, like black moms mm-hmm. have. We have a whole number of other talks. So to this, this idea about these talks around authority, like we, we start to have those fairly soon yeah. um, because we understand like the importance of how our children are perceived and how that interaction occurs in those spaces because it can, it can have negative outcomes. So if you push the wrong button with an authority figure, you are picking your child up from juvenile, <laughs> whether they just suck their teeth or yeah. you know grunt it real loud, like that is the outcome, right? That goes into the harsh punishment that black kids experience mm-hmm. even when they're not doing anything severely aggressive annoying but age appropriately right. defiant right yes. like that's the conversation so in that context we start to look down this this telescope like into kind of the abyss <laughs> that's how I think about like okay. everywhere that Chris and I have been <laughs> it's just out there like I just arrived here at 14 I'm like I don't even know how I got here bro like <laughs> I am grateful I am here, but I also am not really sure. And so this is where this podcast like really means a lot to me to be able to reflect over how far we've come. Cause I promise you like, this has been, it's a feat, (laughs) like it's a challenge. And so in that context, it brings forth like all of these thoughts and ideas about the other talks. So I know I've had with my son and I am 100% sure they're unique to myself as a black mother and raising a black child. And so before we dig into this list of like other talks, I want to make sure I give you a little bit more context on the significance of these talks as a part of our parenting. In the same way that we talked about this calculation of safety, it is this extra additional conglomerate of stuff that we have to talk about. And again, I, I hone in on this idea about protection, that the sole purpose is to counter the socialization of Blackness, right? So what does that mean? So blackness in America and blackness, honestly, across the world, like anti-blackness is a whole global thing yeah. where we receive very specific messaging about blackness. Okay. Absolutely. And in America it's very much a mainstream phenomenon that even shows up in our community. We have internalized mm-hmm. racism mm-hmm. and 
what is internalized racism? It's internalized beliefs and thoughts and expectations about what it means to exist in the black body. Yeah. And we put them on ourselves and we yep. assign them to our brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And so that shows up for us in physical spaces where we get messaging around restraint, around incarceration, around death even, right? We have a lot of conversation. We saw it with the, the young lady who got shot. There were so many yes. differing views about whether or not she deserved yes, to be shot. Yes, that was heartbreaking. How do you like, deserve how do you ever justify? F like there's, I don't care what, how do you deserve to be shot? Yes, she had a, a weapon and yes, it should have been removed. And yes, the right. other girl should have been safe. But how yes. is it that our young people don't get to exist in innocence? They just don't, they don't get, get to exist in innocence. They don't get the- Benefit of the doubt. Benefit of the doubt. <laughs> they don't Absolutely. get the benefit of youth. And this is something that we assign to our kids as well. That's So we go back yeah. to this internalized piece. But again, it boils down to protection. And then we look at the emotional like teachings that come with it. The disappointment, the sadness, the rejection that comes with what it means to have this messaging around Blackness. The socialization around Blackness is less than. As we're working with our kids, we're working to enhance that esteem. We're working to build that confidence because with every experience, we have the poo story with the kids. Experiences like that bring about disappointment, sadness, and rejection in kids. And that's early mm -hmm. on. Who wants to hear that their kids, their face looks like poo? That's what white kids and other kids bring to our kids. And that's what we're protecting them from. That's what we're counteracting. So you'll hear me use that term a lot because the thing about the calculation of safety is not just making sure that we're protecting them, but we are counteracting a lot of messaging that our kids right. receive. Yeah. But we're also in the same breath doing a lot of correcting. Mm -hmm. And that's the psychological, the identity development piece that, that I love and I hone in on yeah. because that is a piece that is interwoven into everything that we do. And that is the part where we enhance their self-esteem. That is the part where we build their confidence. That's where we get our, our girl saying black girl magic with a whole sucking their teeth and everything because it ain't ghetto, right? But right. that's the messaging you receive, mm -hmm. right? And it's momentary so experience. Exactly, no. exactly. Remove that label, think about it this way. Yes. And, and then you're yeah. able to tap into that confidence to just exist, yeah. to be, to hear and know that your behaviors, there's, they're not wrong. Instead of looking around and checking with other measures of rights, mm -hmm. right? And you're like second guessing yourself. This is what we're correcting. This is what we're existing. So because of that, we have to have all of these other types of talk. And we're also like trying to invest, you know, trying to pour into them, right? Yes. Like there's yes. counteracting, there's correcting things. Yep. And then there's also just trying to build, like absolutely, trying to, them, trying to pour in all, you know, which all again, like that's that's all parenting, that's general, that. but then parenting. we have to also correct and counteract, and correct yes, and counteract, um, and that's where I want our allies to meet us, right? We all parents. Mm -hmm. I want you to meet us at that intersection of, hey, we're all generally parenting. We're all generally pouring yes. into our kids. And on top of that, your Black friends, <laughs> your Black friends are not only counteracting things, but also correcting things. Absolutely. Um, and if you've been living under a rock and you don't know the story we just referenced, it was the police killing of Micaiah Bryant. Yes. If you're wondering. Part of what we want to do with these um, parenting conversations is give you stories so you can sort of see the depth of stories <laughs> that, yeah. that we have that uh, demonstrate the different types of talks, all the ways that we have to continually counteract and correct and, and then rebuild, depending on what has happened, <laughs> that we're counteracting and correcting, um, we build our kids so that they don't internalize this anti-Black racism that is just everywhere. So I talked about in the previous episode about how um, I was very intentional about Jala loving her hair and uh, viewing her hair as magical because it could do so many things. And we did very different, many different styles and um, updos and, you know, straighten it and let it fall and put it in braids and bantu knots, like everything. Yeah. Um, and that was very, very intentional. Um, so we had, I, I would say mini talks you know, sometimes it was when we we're doing her hair. Sometimes it's just me intentionally using different words to describe other people's hair. Mm -hmm. Like if it was not something that I know she's going to see on TV or in media that says that this type of hair or this style of hair is beautiful. I was intentional 
to, to name that, to call that style or that you know, texture of hair beautiful in her presence, even if I wasn't talking directly to her. Even if I'm just flipping through a magazine and going, man, I really love her hair. Ooh, this is fierce. You know, like just to surround her, just so she like is ingesting that, that is that counteracting, knowing that she's not seeing uh, her hair, her hair and um, the different styles that we were doing represented, you know, across the board. But she's, she's learning and just sort of um, growing up understanding this is beautiful. That is a wonderful example. And I think I'll follow suit with you and kind of use the story from the last episode as well. Cause I think that was the foundation of everything for me with Chris around this idea of his complexion. So my baby is Mm -hmm. good and chocolate, like good milk chocolate. To the point that even to the example that you described, like I started out very early intentionally making um, associations with like sweetness and Mm -hmm. um, smoothness and desire, right? Like, so I would tell him like chocolate, like you're chocolate and I will eat you up. (laughs) <laughs> like just let me eat this little finger up because it's so delicious right. right so i use words like delicious and, and this is very age appropriate because they don't get like you're beautiful what do they know about beauty yeah. right they're yeah. like four right yeah but they understand <laughs> things that they want to consume the positive association yes. with things that are sweet and yes, yes. and and sought after everybody yes. loves chocolate <laughs> so that's what i was saying it's like you're like chocolate i'm gonna eat you up it's all like home gnaw on his face yeah. like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um And it's that context that laid the foundation for me. Like I didn't have a conversation that says, hey, the world sees your skin as undesirable. I did the opposite. Like I planted a seed in the same way that you did with her here. I planted a seed. And to your point, this is very important from a colorism perspective. Mm -hmm. Anytime he noticed there was a a lighter complexion, right? Or a different Mm. complexion. Mm-hmm. We would have that conversation and I would compare it to sweetness as well, because mm-hmm. I needed him to understand that we, we do exist in, on a spectrum, in a spectrum. It's, and it's not a hierarchy. Exactly. Exactly. This is what, that's the message you're going to get out there. And yes. that's false. And that we all have desirable complexions because my family is very much, we have all mm-hmm. kinds of shades in our family. And in that same breath, I was very aware of correcting those around me who use the language yes. that I did not want to push forward in my child. I didn't, mm. if he, and I, but the thing was, I didn't try to keep him from it. That was the other thing. Mm. So I want you to be exposed to it, but I want you to have a context and understand yes. it. And I also want you to see your mother effectively communicate around mm. what that means. Because mm-hmm. remember, if we're going to speak to racial socialization in the black, as black parents, we got to talk about it all. Yeah. And this is this is that internalized stuff, yep. right? We sometimes we are protecting ourselves from our internalized from ourselves. experiences <laughs> in black yes. families. Absolutely. And I am from a family where my mother is lighter complected and her grandmother treated her mm-hmm. differently because she was of a different complexion. Mm-hmm. She's lighter than me. These are things that we have to counteract. So there seems to be this theme early on that I don't think that I'm doing much correcting at this age, maybe because he doesn't have the wherewithal to have the ability yes. to really process uh-huh. that. But I'm definitely planting seeds that will counteract some of the things that will come to him later on. For sure. Or that could potentially be there and I'm just unaware of it, right? Because he hasn't yeah. expressed it or give it, put language to it. Yeah. Now, how do you think that changes when when he gets a little bit older, six to eight years old, let's say? Do you still think you're counteracting when you think back to that developmental phase or did it move into correction or, or, or building? I think the counteracting for me, you'll probably see that throughout the rest of his life. Like I'm still counteracting yeah. stuff. But I think as he gets older, right? So the six to eight phase, this is where we're dealing with discipline as a young black boy, right? So this is the school setting. This is me having conversations with him about how the teachers will respond. Now the teachers loved him. He was a great kid. Um, he went to a mon- he was in a Montessori setting. It was mixed, mixed race, ethnic, ethno-racial groups. And so, and the teachers, let me think. <laughs> I was trying to think of if he had a black teacher. All the teachers were white. But his principal was black. So all the, the, okay. the leadership in the building was black. Um, but the oh. educators were white. So that is very important. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Because that principal was very intentional about black boys because she had a black boy. So the way she dealt with black boys, discipline was handled 
in a more Afrocentric way, meaning I'm going to get on your level. We're going to communicate face to face, but ultimately my expectation is of high standards. Exactly. So there is no BS. I'm not playing this game with you. There's very direct mm -hmm. communication. I'm going to effectively communicate what my expectations of you are. I'm going to give you that look that says, I expect to see it right away. Not when you feel like it, but right away. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to move on to something that, that makes sense. But he still had white teachers. And so mm -hmm. we had to have conversations, especially around teachers treating him different because of that like his interactions with them because the, at this point i guess we're going into the talk of an authority figure and i think that ha setting. that happens as soon as yep. you enter the school setting it's like yep. okay you have eight different adults in your life all of a sudden yep. or whatever so in that realm mm -hmm. that's pretty much what that looked like it was really getting him because remember that's at the point where i was very much introducing him to black studies right like any event right. that happened he knew about it he went back because at that age they just want to share everything yeah. And at that age, as a black boy, you, he he still didn't fit in that box. And he's also was like the kid who danced and smiled. And sometimes he didn't want to do his homework, but for the most part, he got good grades. And so he just didn't fit in a box. So when yep. he was not doing what he didn't want to do, we had to have consequences. I mean, conversations about consequences and how mm -hmm. it's probable that your consequences will be harsher, you know, yeah. just based on the, the way they perceive your defiance, right? Because you're yeah. it's not just developmentally appropriate. Yeah, defiance. It's not developmentally appropriate. Like I I just don't want to do it because I'm a kid and I don't want to do it. And we see yeah. that in adolescence now. But it's like, no, there's something about you and what you're you're bucking against my authority. Like mm -hmm. he's a whole adult. No, he's just a regular mm -hmm. hard head kid. Mm -hmm. So that's the conversations that I recall at that time. Mm -hmm. I remember that. I would say this was probably like I I didn't really have concerns about authority figures in a school setting because as I, as I shared in a previous episode. Before third grade, she was in a school that was very, the Black children and adults were the majority represented mm -hmm. in the school. And so there was there was a lot of like culturally familiar ways of <laughs> dealing with kids that, so mm -hmm. for her, it was, you know, it was a smooth experience. I mean, you still had teachers that were stricter. You still had yeah, variety, absolutely. obviously, mm -hmm. but no concerns there, really. When we moved, we um, we went into a school that was predominantly white. You know, over the course of that first year, I started meeting other parents, and I started interacting with more adults in the school. And you know, um, the things I assumed were confirmed. Like, yeah, I'm gonna have to pay. I'm gonna have to pay a lot more attention here, and and start to pay attention to what she's coming home and telling me about mm -hmm. her teachers, and mm -hmm. start listening with that very critical ear. And then mm -hmm. and then building relationships. So I started to build relationships with other black parents in the schools and other non-white parents in the schools. Um, and you start to learn about certain teachers that have a certain mm. way of acting and treating different kids. Mm. And so, you know, she was also a, a child that was raised to be a, 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 a critical thinker, to process things, mm -hmm. and to, to use her words. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. from a very early age, it was like, use it. we would go out to a restaurant, and I would say, what are you asking me? Okay, um, sir, ask the server. Like, I was yep. teaching her to be able to communicate. Absolutely. From, a, from an early age, all of those things start to come into play in our discussions when she's like, well, I was scared. I didn't want to say anything yes. in that, in the, to that teacher. I, I have to break that down. Okay, what yes. is happening that you're scared? Yes. Is it just a general anxiety, which it could yes. be, or is something else happening in this classroom that I need to dig into? Yes. Like, I can't just let that go. Yes. And that's the difference, again, between just parenting and parenting a black child as a black parent. You hear those things differently because there was one yes. teacher that I always had a funny feeling about. And then there was an incident that happened um, in the school that I would have never heard about if another, so this was a white teacher. Jalai was in an after, after school program. She forgot something in the classroom. So because she was still in the building and the teacher was still in the classroom, she asked the after school lady, could she go down to the classroom to get the folder that she forgot? And for some reason, the after school teacher kind of like followed her or like was looking out for her, like, because this building is empty and mm -hmm. keeping an eye on her and apparently overheard the teacher just railing at her, just mm -hmm. yelling at Jella about how it's not fair. Just because she's in the building, she needs to be more responsible and not forget her things. Wow. And it's not, she just happens to be in the building for after school. For I'm getting hot just thinking about this again. This is also a teacher that we were starting to realize that she treated Black boys very differently mm -hmm. um, in her classroom. And she was doing this weird manipulation thing where she would like give mm -hmm. the kids candy 
to try to like act like, you know, be friends with them after she would do something like yell at them. I was just like, this is so wrong, fucked up wrong. on so many levels. <laughs> yes. When I went to go pick up July from aftercare that day, she felt conflicted because she was like, this is my colleague <laughs> to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. I feel conflicted, but I feel like I have to tell you what happened. Like yes. really, she was overreacting. This is what happened. She was very careful with her words, but she said enough for me to feel like, okay, what you saw wasn't okay. And you wanted me to know that because I'm going to get it from a kid and you were the only other adult that saw what happened other than the person that was doing the yelling. Before we got home, I had an email from the teacher Mm. herself. Mm. And to hear her description of what happened, I was like, you are a gold faith liar. Like, different, girl. It was all about, you know, I just, you know, we try to teach the kids responsibility. And I had a conversation with her about this. I was like, you are such a fucking liar. No, you did not. Yes. And think about, so think about keeping us in the context of Black parenting, right? Because we talk to our allies, but we're also talking to our other Black mothers. That's one of the things that came up for me too, as a person who like values respect and values like how you present yourself as my child. Like I am on top right. of it. Like if I hear about you being disrespectful, exactly. an adult, you got to come see me. Yes. Except, Except it's when this, this is exactly. happening and you're like, exactly holding your kid to a standard but yes. you don't understand like adult. this is not the adult is so yes. wrong in the scenario and i would not yes. have known that yes i this other adult not said let me pull you to yep. the side and tell you what happened just so you know what really yep. happened because i bet you already knew we were going to get a whole a totally different story and it was funny because the teacher didn't have a reason to send me an email but i think she felt like she realized that Jola could come home and tell the story. Mm-hmm. And she was tr- she was really trying to counteract Jola's story before Jola even mm-hmm. got home to tell us. And talk about so allyship and the other teacher. Like that's, yes. a, that's a space where, and, and I don't know if that the other teacher who said something was black or white. And it's irrelevant at this point because I'm exactly. speaking specifically to ways to be an ally to a parent and a child, right? Absolutely. Way to protect that child. Protect that child because yes. if I- if I would have believed the teacher's story, yes, that Jola I would have played trouble. fault <laughs> on my child. So many levels. I think it's important to also talk about, we talked about how the adults, the after school teacher mm-hmm. was an ally there. Jola has also had incidents where her friend, like her classmate and friend was an ally. And I'm not going to go into the story, but basically it was like Martin Luther King Day or that week at school. I think they were talking about like Ruby Bridges and having conversations about, you know, do you think that Martin's dream has been realized today or not? Let's have a discussion about why. Um, And I don't even remember exactly what happened, but something was happening in this like small group conversation. And Jala's friend said something to Jala about like, well, you could do that or you would understand that because you have the skin color for it. And I wish I could remember exactly what was the context, but I don't. What's important is that it was a, it was like a left field comment and Jala at, I want to say this was third grade was like, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. And this is where like teaching your child to advocate for themselves and being able to communicate Mm -hmm. is so important because in the moment she told her friend, like, that's not okay. And that's really offensive. I don't know if she used the word Mm -hmm. offensive, but like Mm -hmm. that inappropriate (laughs) vocabulary. But what was, what was really amazing about it is her friend wasn't defensive. She heard her and she apologized and said, oh, I didn't, I don't, I didn't understand that. And I don't want, I didn't mean to, to hurt you. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And Jala was like, oh, it's okay. And it was over mm-hmm. just like that. Done. <laughs> and so when Jala is telling me the story, I took the opportunity to pause because I, I needed her to recognize something about her friend. And this was a white yes. girl because that girl could have been yes. defensive could have prioritized what she intended or didn't intend to do yep. instead of being like, oh, I did something and my friend doesn't like it. She's yes. telling me this is inappropriate. Yes. I should just listen to that and and, yep. and repair the relationship, apologize for doing something, even though it wasn't my intent. And they, yep. they just moved on like that. Like it was, it was nothing. I was like, just wonderful. this is amazing. And I, I need you to understand, Jola, that she, that is like, you have surface level yes. white friends and then you have yes. like be- beneath the surface my friends yes. that are true friends even in the context of racial tension yes. they can still work through that with you and yes. that is valuable like so there's also this other type of talk 
that we're helping our kids, like we're helping them navigate friendships and relationships from yes. a, with a racial sort of context yes. to understand like, who can you really feel 100% safe yes. around? And who can you not? Because they won't understand when something is a, that's a Black issue comes up. They don't have the ability to sit in the mess with you. They don't have the, the you know, cultural humility to just hear you and center what you're saying and not get defensive. So that's also another sort of lane of conversation that's consistent yep. as they grow up. And as they grow up, that shifts into having a conversation about who you date. Yeah, absolutely. So as we take our our experiences into them getting a little bit older, you know, less cute. I mean, they're still <laughs> cute, but you know, more vocal and verbal. This is where all of our hard work and the foundation that we put into turning them into yeah. little advocates for themselves and being able to communicate. This is where we're sitting scratching our heads. Like, did we do the right thing? <laughs> But, but no, like seriously. So I brought that up because the next age range is Chris in the ninth through 11 years. And so this is yeah. when Chris transitioned to a different school. He's finishing out his fifth grade year in a whole nother area. Um, now, mind you, remember he came from a Montessori that was more mixed with a principal and that administrative team was predominantly right. black. So it had that, that Afrocentric, like centered kind of approach. Yeah. He's now in a school where the ethno-racial makeup is completely different and it's more of a white centered community. Now, this is an interesting piece that I want my allies to really, really hear. I'm going to share with you about our experience shifting from Kentucky whiteness to Michigan whiteness. So let me tell you what that means. <laughs> Okay. When we hear overt versus covert racism, we know the difference, right? Yeah. Covert mm -hmm. is like, it is right there. Like, I called you colored. <laughs> right. That is overt in your face. And I yep. appreciate my Kentucky folk for that because I know who I'm getting. There ain't exactly. no fans or butts about it. They say, hey, because they're going to share with you. I think you're color, even though anybody use color now, I don't know how long. Mm -hmm. But the Michigan folks, let me tell you about these Michigan folks. We're very clear. I, I think, think you're this. Uh, I think you're that. I don't mm -hmm. think our, I don't believe mm -hmm. in mixed race dating. We ain't, we ain't uh, really doing all that. And I'm like, you know what? I'm so glad that I know that. You can have black people and racist white people live neighbors. Absolutely. But we know where we stand. But, and that's what we're doing. So the Michigan whiteness is our own mm. northern whiteness because this mm. is the difference between northern and southern whiteness. And this is where the white folks don't think they're racist. And they don't mm. think they're racist because they're a part of the LGBTQI community, community, or they are identified with some other marginalized group. And so for that reason, they completely understand what it means to be oppressed, right? Just, we'll just stop there. They completely know what it means to be oppressed. What that means from a parenting academic perspective, so being a black parent going into this particular setting is, there's a lot of unspoken expectations around interacting. So on the surface, they say, we are all accepting. Mm -hmm. In practice, it looks a lot different. Mm -hmm. So this played out a couple of times in that particular school where Chris, new setting, Chris is transitioning, he's struggling. He's struggling transitioning, he links up with this white kid. So, and, and Chris is used to having a mixed group of friends. So he gets up there and he aligns with this particular white kid who has a lot of behavioral issues by just by association. Let me tell you what. Chris was getting <laughs> a lot of blowback from this kid. Yes. And when I would go to the parent teacher conference, Chris has never had an issue academically, but I, Chris was also transitioning from a school, leaving his friends. He's 11 years old and he's struggling. And even with all of that, he's still not acting out mm. except this other kid was like the kind of kid, the one of the white kids that smacks their mama in front of everybody. Like oh. that's the kind, yes, he was that kid. Oh. The kind where you're on TV. You like, where you, you want to like, snatch up the kids because you're like, you are so wrong. So, so why I bring that up oh. is because this is what the teacher was equating to be the same. You wow. have this kid who is physically aggressive, outright defiant, walking out the classroom, will tell you verbally, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And when I was in a parent-teacher conference, trying to explain to that, to the teacher and trying to get an understanding of what the influence is that was going on around my child, because we know that peer influence is a real thing. They kept trying to shut me down to the point where he, he tried to talk over me. And when I let him finish, I explained to him that you're not going to carve out and associate my child because yeah. he would say things like he has such potential. I, I, he needs to decide who he wants to be. 
Well, he has decided. What? <laughs> he's not that badass kid. He's you need to decide quiet, what you want to see and acknowledge and what you don't want to see and, and acknowledge. And that's the thing. That's so because what Chris yeah. didn't fit in the box, and this is the right. conversation that I had to have with Chris, Chris didn't fit in the typical Black bad kid box because he wasn't physically or verbally aggressive. It's he wasn't like, outright defiant. So they didn't know what to do with him. He had a script. Because his and great, they were like, yes. this is what we're used to saying about yes. Like, we don't have anything else to say. He yes. needs to decide who he wants to be. And yes. Like, I'm sorry, sorry, what? <laughs> yes. But I had to have a conversation with him now, after we had the parent teacher conference about what is what is going to look like when it shows up on your report card yeah what it means for your teachers if because it's going to affect your grade i don't care yep. if you're the smartest kid in the class they're going to give you a c because uh -huh. behaviorally they can't see you being smart and defiant right, right. they can't capture hold both of those uh, in the face uh. so that's what i had to have a conversation with him about wow. about what it means to not fit in a box as the black kid especially when their standard for you is all the way down here because they don't create spaces for smart black kids because if you're a smart black kid you got to be a damn genius and sometimes even when you're a genius they're still like no yeah they don't stay. you <laughs> they don't move you they don't do anything yeah i have a niece going through that right now like really? they, don't, they don't care what she does they're like yeah we're not doing anything special she's nine ten maybe she just wrote a paper on like einstein's something about time travel for fun really? Girl. Like she researched, she had a bibliography. What 10 year old do you know writing a paper with a bibliography? I was like, I saw this paper and I told my sister, I was like, you have got to do something different with her. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what is happening? I can barely understand this paper she wrote. I had to read it twice. <laughs> but you're right. Like the, the space to be like, wow, you're smart. If that's not enough, yep. to get them to realize like, oh, let's let's figure out how do we accommodate her level of, you know, intelligence and, and yep. giftedness. The, what's happening to the kids that are just yes. regular Average. smart? Like just regular smart. right. And if you just invest and cultivate what they yes. have, that it would be, it would like set them on a different trajectory. Yes. What's happening to all of those kids? Nothing. And that's the thing, right? This idea of me having to explain to him. And this is the first time I had a conversation about academic expectations. And I have a more detailed one in the next age group. That's but a talk. The, it that's is. Talk. The academic expectations. Like they don't expect mm -hmm. you to be great. And they mm -hmm. really could not. And I saw the adult struggling with what to do with him. And, and, and even what to do with me as a Black involved educator, yes. right? Parent. Like they did not know what to do with me. That's because they weren't calling me up there to say, I didn't need them to say me. I yep. didn't need them to give me any resources. Yep. I didn't need any of that. They yep. they weren't, I know what I'm talking about, sir. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what's happening. Yep. And the fact that I was challenging, I was a challenge. Mm -hmm. I was a threat automatically. So I'm so used to yep. being able to walk in as a threat. I, I don't even got to do yeah. nothing. I'm a threat. And on top of that, I mm -hmm. then started having to have conversations with him about his attraction to white girls. Mm. And not that he was so much attracted to white girls, quote unquote, white girls. It wasn't that thing. It was this weird dynamic, Nikkei. It was so freaking weird. Like they had a talent show and I told you the, the ethno-racial makeup. And of course, all the black kids dance, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was the thing. So of course my son came up, he made up his own dance. He was in there, he got on stage. Girl, when I tell you the entire section of the fifth grade white girls was going off, I said, oh no, absolutely not. Wow. That shit was alarming to me. Wow. And I'm going to tell you why it was alarming to me. Because in that time, my son had gone to two sleepovers. One was for a girl, one was for a boy. In that time, I had met parents. In that time, I had met kids. In that mm -hmm. time, I had overheard and observed mm. reactions to my only Black child wow. in the room. So while these girls over here swooning for my son, wow. their parents are tightly grabbing their hand. This is fifth grade. They are never too young to be accused of anything. Yep. This is my mindset. Yep. So you talk about, again, we going back to uh, the calculations of safety. Yes. Immediately turned you are on. not safe near I those girls. immediately yes. turned on. Yes. And so I want my the, the listeners to hear this. This is not even about fantasy attraction dating mm -hmm. in the sense that we understand as adults. This mm -hmm. is about children being allowed to explore attraction. They're like, boy, because this is what you do. Like, this is my boyfriend, this, this is my best yeah, friend. Blah, blah, this blah. Is, they're experimenting. Except <laughs> my little black boy, while all the girls think he's cute, all the moms and dads are concerned. Mm -hmm. And he's only 11. Yeah. And this is how they're grabbing their hands. This is how they're 
um, mm. having them interact at the at the birthday parties. I'm sitting here watching. Instead of allowing even him to be able to go through this uh, developmentally appropriate they like you, you like them, whatever. You have to then give him the con the, the bigger context. And not just out of the blue, but based on my observation of these parents right. and their interaction with him. So many parents are doing it just because we don't have to see it, but we know. But the fact that you actually- Observed it. Had all the data. All the evidence. Lord have mercy. And the thing that's really sad about that too is, this is when we say that racism impacts everybody. We don't know that anything, like let's let's presume that there's a, a black boy who does have a crush on a white yeah. uh, girl or and vice versa. We don't know that anything would necessarily go wrong in Absolutely that. Absolutely not. Because for, especially the kids today, you know, they've grown up in a different <laughs> world for the most part. You can still go to some, you know, corners of the country and it's the same world as it was 75 years ago. Yeah. It's not even the kids themselves it's what's the very normal developmental thing that could happen between these yeah. two children and then i am on the opposite side of a conflict that's being escalated yes. by this white parent yes. who did not grow yes. up in the 2000s <laughs> yes. who i've already witnessed clutch her purse or yes. whatever look sideways at my kid like yep. that is the the calculation of safety All right, folks, we're going to end it there for now. We want to make sure we hear from you. So send us a note or your thoughts on the question of the day. And if you want to speak to us on a topic, send it our way. You can find us on our social media platform at wannabeanally or email us at wannabeanally at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to So You Want to Be an Ally wherever you get your personal podcasts. You can find me, Alani Ke, at my website, www.mosaicforequity.com. That's mosaic, M-O-S-A-I-C, four, as in the digit four, equity, E-Q-U-I-T-Y. Follow me on Facebook and on LinkedIn at Mosaic for Equity. You can find me with that handle and on Instagram as well. You can find me, Darlene, at my website, www.parentszonellc.com. And follow me on Facebook at Donnie Davis, that's D-A-U-N-I, and Parent Zone LLC. And on Instagram at PZ Parenting Coaching. All right, we're out. Bye. See you later. <laughs>